In this video, we're going to discuss how you would treat a posterior or anterior cupulolithiasis, and it's with a technique called the Simon Liberatory Maneuver. Now, before we get into the demonstration of that technique, let's review how you would even know that this treatment was necessary. Let's suppose you have a patient whom you suspect has BPPV based on subjective reports of dizziness and a visual change that the room is spinning. So you perform the dix hull pike maneuver and it's positive. Remember that a positive dix hull pike maneuver causes the production of vertical nystagmus. And that vertical nystagmus can be up or down beating. If the nystagmus is down beating, then it implicates the anterior or superior semicircular canal. And if the nystagmus is up beating, it implicates the posterior semicircular canal. And while doing that dix hull pike maneuver, you assess the duration of the nystagmus. If the nystagmus lasts less than a minute, less than 60 seconds, that's going to be a canalothiasis, and you treat that with the Epley maneuver. However, if the nystagmus lasts longer than a minute, so greater than 60 seconds, then that means you have a cupulolithiasis. And that's how you know to treat this with the Seamont Liberatory maneuver. So here, I'm going to show you the Seamont Liberatory Maneuver for a cupulolithiasis of either the right posterior canal or the right anterior canal. In other words, the right side is affected. So the beginning patient position is going to be in short seated, as you see right here, in contralateral neck rotation about 45 degrees. Contralateral meaning toward the unaffected side. We're treating a right cupulolithiasis. So she has her head rotated toward the left, towards the contralateral or unaffected side. Now you can't see it right here, but with both my hands I'm gripping either side of her head just above her ears. And then, once I have a good grip, I'm going to very quickly and forcefully tilt her ipsilaterally all the way down toward her affected side, which in this case is the right. While she maintains that 45 degrees of neck rotation to the contralateral or unaffected side. Once she's down, this is position two and our first stopping point. Now, when we stop here, we're waiting for the symptoms to go away. And in general, we're going to wait longer than we did for the canalothiases. So our stopping point here is going to be, as you can see, two to three minutes overall, roughly. Uh, or in general, we can wait 45 seconds after the symptoms stop. But remember, since this is a cupulolithiasis, the symptoms are going to last longer because in general, that nystagmus lasts longer than 60 seconds. So we're waiting here at these stopping periods longer than we did for the corresponding canalothiases. Now a couple other things to note here. We're treating a right cupulolithiasis. So again, it's contralateral neck rotation, neck rotation to the left. So when I tilt her ipsilaterally all the way, that's tilting her all the way to the right side. And so when she's in that position due to the neck rotation, she's more or less looking up at the ceiling. So hopefully that makes sense. Once you've waited for the appropriate amount of time, the patient's then going to be quickly and forcefully tilted all the way toward their unaffected side, in this case the contralateral side, which is the left, as you'll see right here. And notice throughout the entire movement, she's maintaining 45 degrees of that neck rotation toward the unaffected or contralateral side. So the neck rotation doesn't change at all in this maneuver. Once she gets here, this is position three. And again, you wait for the appropriate amount of time, either about two to three minutes overall, or 45 seconds after all the symptoms stop. Now, another thing to point out here, because her neck is rotated to the left, when I move her from position two to position three, she's now going to be looking more or less into the treatment table toward the floor in position three. And then finally, once you've waited for the appropriate amount of time in position three, the patient is allowed to sit up slowly. This movement is not fast. And you're also going to want to stick close by and probably have a hand on the patient because this is a cupulolithiasis that you're treating. And so the symptoms are often very severe and you don't want them to fall off the edge of the table. They're also instructed in this final position to maintain that 45 degrees of neck rotation just for about a minute and just to sit there and kind of wait for all the symptoms to calm down. They may still have some symptoms after this is over though. 
Now remember that when you have displaced autoliths within the canals themselves, that's a canalithiasis. And when you're treating a canalithiasis with a canalith repositioning maneuver, they don't need to be fast and they don't need to be forceful. You're really just moving the head and the neck in various ways and using gravity to move those autoliths around back into the utricle. Remember that the fluid within the canal is very water-like, so it's easy to move these autoliths through that. But in contrast, the cupula is like honey or molasses. Those autoliths are pretty much adhered to its surface. So just moving the head relative to gravity is not going to displace those autoliths. That's why the liberatory maneuvers, like the Seamount liberatory maneuver, require speed and force. So for example, in the transition between position one and position two, where I am forcefully driving the patient's head into the treatment table, I am literally trying to dislodge these autoliths from the cupula and move them into the canal. So coming over here, when I do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver and it's positive, and I get that vertical nystagmus that lasts longer than 60 seconds, that indicates I have the cupula lithiasis, and so I perform the Seamont liberatory maneuver. I am literally attempting to drive those autoliths from the cupula where they are adhered into the canal. Once I do the Seamont liberatory maneuver, I need to reassess with the Dix Hall Pike. I do the same thing over again. If I still come back here and the nystagmus lasts longer than 60 seconds, have I successfully driven these autoliths from the cupula? No, they're still adhered there. So I need to do the Seamont liberatory maneuver again, and then once again reassess the Dix Hall Pike. However, Let's suppose I do the Seamount Liberatory Maneuver, and I do the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver, it's still positive, I have vertical nystagmus, but now the nystagmus lasts less than a minute. What does that mean? It means I successfully drove those autoliths off of the cupula and into the canal. Now I can do an Epley Maneuver, and if it's the anterior canal, I could certainly do the deep head hanging maneuver. But the bottom line is, Anytime I do the Seamount Liberatory Maneuver, I always need to reassess with the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver to make sure that the nystagmus has now transitioned to being less than a minute. And if it's transitioned to being less than a minute, that means I have successfully moved the autoliths from the cupula to the canal because that would mean I have a canal lithiasis, and then I can treat with a canalith repositioning maneuver.